Hello, I'm the Resident Cartographer, and this is the story of what happened to the Enclave forces headquartered in the Congressional Bunker beneath the White Spring Resort. When the residents of Vault 76 emerged from their 26 years of sheltering underground in October 2102, they found Appalachia completely devoid of survivors. Projections for the outcome of the nuclear war had been bad, but they'd expected some people to survive outside the protection of the vaults. The forest outside was lush and green full of animals that, though strange, were still alive and generally healthy for what they were. Venturing further out, the vault dwellers encountered terrifying, red-skinned, animate corpses. These green crystal embedded figures shouted simple sentences while sprinting, shooting, and swinging at them. Investigation into these cryptic monsters revealed that they were what remained of those missing surviving residents of Appalachia. Named the Scorched by those who encountered them, these creatures had been brought into being by an infection that converted those who had weathered the nuclear war into seemingly mindless beasts. While the infection, named the Scorched Plague, could spread from scorched humans to their uninfected victims, its original source was a species of enormous bat known as the Scorched Beasts. While the origin of the Scorched Plague and the Scorched Beasts was generally unknown to those who fell to their terrible might, the residents of Vault 76 soon discovered that this second world-ending event was not natural. Indeed, the disease and its original animal host were creations of the insidious shadow government that had controlled the United States from behind the scenes in the years before the bombs. Known as the Enclave, this organization had ridden out the worst of the bombs hidden in bunkers and remote locations across America. The local chapter had wiped humanity from Appalachia, and had their deeds not been undone, they would have potentially wiped mankind from the face of the earth. It seems that if there was a President Eisenhower in the Fallout universe, that his warning about the influence of the military-industrial complex was taken as a challenge to create an actual organization. In the pre-war years, the Enclave had counted among its members corporate executives, military leaders, and politicians. By the late 2070s, even the President of the United States and many members of his cabinet were members. As the war with China ground on and the possibility of a nuclear exchange seemed increasingly likely, the Enclave constructed a series of safe houses across the country. These bunkers, approved by the Congress when built with taxpayer dollars, had the supposed mission of protecting the American government in the aftermath of the war. From these subterranean dwellings, the politicians and military could continue to govern, serve, and protect the people of the United States. Among these bunkers was the Congressional Bunker built in secret beneath the White Spring Resort in West Virginia. While the stated purpose of this bunker was to house members of the Congress, the President, and their Cabinet, the true masters would be the Enclave. This wasn't an afterthought or an alteration of the original intent. The plans for the bunker detail a maximum occupancy of 200. The United States Congress has 535 members. The President and the Cabinet add another dozen or more. This doesn't even take into account the families of these individuals, much less their staff members. Just based on numbers, this bunker was never meant to shelter the elected government of the United States. Instead, the Enclave outfitted this bunker to serve as the post-apocalyptic command center for themselves. The site was to be overseen by the Multi-Operation Directions and Utility System, or MODIS. A purpose-built AI, MODIS would oversee the robotic staff of the bunker and maintain a connection to the orbital Kovac Muldoon platform, giving the Enclave a powerful tool in the aftermath of the bombs. The bunker also received special attention from the Department of Agriculture with the Congressional Bunker Food Preservation Initiative. But just as the bunker was the Congressional Bunker in name only, the program was a false front. The true purpose of this program was the creation of a state-of-the-art bioweapons lab within the White Spring Bunker, a project that was directly overseen by Secretary of Agriculture and Enclave member Thomas Eckhart. Equipment for this laboratory was shipped in secret by rail to the Mount Blair train yard, from which it was then carried by truck to the White Spring Resort. Coming in as furniture, the resort security guards were both frustrated by the refusal to allow them to search the contents of the containers being shipped in, and confused as they couldn't see how the resort could need more furniture or the multitude of sentry bots that came through in other shipments. All of this secret activity was catching the eye of watchdogs though, and the word of the true purpose of this bunker was leaking to non-enclave members of the Congress, like Senator Sam Blackwell. A true representative of the needs of the people of his state, Senator Blackwell was always looking out for threats to his constituents. When investigating the early warning systems that were built to alert the people of an impending nuclear attack, he discovered, quote, timing discrepancies, end quote, that could lead to the military and government having an advantage in time over the general public. 
His attempts to bring this issue to light were met with threats from the Defense Department. Setting that issue aside for a time, Senator Blackwell was drawn in by messages of an enigmatic figure that we know only by the initial T. These messages pointed to something being rotten within the United States Department of Agriculture, including the Bioweapons Lab of the White Spring. In conducting his own investigations, Senator Blackwell stumbled across the edges of the Enclave. With just a glimpse at this shadowy cabal and their agenda, Senator Blackwell joined the survivalist, separatist, anti-government group known as the Free States. He even had a bunker constructed for himself and his family. Fatefully, it was not long after Senator Blackwell's investigations into the Enclave that the Appalachian Ballot Measure 6 was proposed. This ballot measure was intended to automate the entire state government, replacing thousands of human laborers with robots. Senator Blackwell was no Luddite, and he recognized that automation was inevitable, but he also recognized the threat that it posed to his constituents, and thus he wanted to slow roll the rise of automation. To that end, he came out in public opposition to the law. Daniel Hornwright, the owner of the mining company and robotics manufacturer Hornwright Industrial, stood to benefit greatly if the ballot measure passed. Mr. Hornwright decided that he needed Senator Blackwell out of the public spotlight, and thus he sent a fixer after the senator, with orders not to harm, but to scare him. Upon receiving threats against the life of his daughter, Senator Blackwell picked her up from school at vault -Tec University and fled to his bunker. This sudden disappearance worried the public, so he decided to give an interview from his bunker. Charleston Herald reporter Quinn Carter trekked cross-country, blindfolded to this bunker, hidden within a false nuclear waste dump. In this interview, Senator Blackwell explained that he had fled because he had peeked into the world of dangerous, powerful men, and they had come after his family. He warned his constituents that the government didn't care to protect them and that the end was coming. Having been previously threatened by presumed members of the Enclave, he mistook the empty threats of Mr. Hornwright's fixer with the deadly, serious threat of the Enclave. Senator Blackwell abandoned public life and resigned his seat as senator. This interview would put both Sam Blackwell and Quinn Carter on the radar for the Enclave. Mr. Blackwell as a threat to their operations, and Miss Carter as a means to find him. While he was wrong about who was targeting his family, Senator Blackwell was right that the end was coming. And on the morning of Saturday, October 23, 2077, China and the United States initiated a brief nuclear exchange that ended the old world. When the nuclear exchange kicked off, automated systems at the White Spring Bunker sent out early warnings to the members of the government just as Blackwell thought. It turns out though that the conspiracy went even deeper, as non-enclave members of the government had had their contact information removed from the system and thus they received no such early warning. Despite this, many non-enclave congressmen managed to trek to the bunker. Unfortunately for them, they were granted access. I say unfortunately as once they'd been interviewed, these non-enclave members of Congress were executed in mass. With fallout coming down across the world, Enclave officers at the White Spring Bunker struggled to make contact with their counterparts at the Poseidon Energy Oil Rig. The rig, also known as Control Station Enclave, had served as the home of the President of the United States for the past six months. The communications officers at the White Spring soon discovered that no communication from the President would be coming. The hard line crossing the continent was built to weather a nuclear war. It appeared that Control Station Enclave might have simply refused to make contact. Without a connection to the president, the continuity of government plan had passed control down the chain of command. Three members of the cabinet managed to reach the bunker. Both the secretaries of interior and treasury died of acute radiation poisoning after arriving, leaving secretary of agriculture Thomas Eckhart as the last man standing and in line for control of the bunker in which he had invested so much of his efforts before the war. A strange coincidence. While Thomas Eckhart was in charge according to the plans laid out before the war, Support for his plans were far from unanimous. He was out for blood. The communist Chinese had vaporized millions of his countrymen and set his nation on fire. He wasn't going to stop the war until they were gone from the world. However, many in the bunker were simply looking to ride out the worst of the storm and start expanding their dominion when the time was right. Learning of dissension in the ranks, Eckhart called for a vote. The Enclave was a democracy, he told them. If you agreed with him, come to his side of the room. If you wanted to end the war, go to the other. He took his supporters out with him, leaving his agent Jefferson Gray with those who opposed him to, quote, sort out accommodations for you all, end quote. This purge left the White Spring Enclave unified in purpose, but with a population of 48. The Enclave focused on projects that they could accomplish with their reduced staff. In order to continue the war against the Chinese, Secretary Eckhart knew that he would need access to the automated nuclear missile silos of Appalachia. These silos had been built with the goal of total automation aside from a small team of missileers. 
Their large stockpiles of material and robotic staff were designed to reload the silos many, many times. Along with the silos themselves being automated, they were connected to an automated DEF CON system. This system, connected to the Kovac Muldoon orbital platform, was intended to ensure that missiles could not be launched except for in the state of war. This was intended to prevent rogue officers from initiating a launch without provocation. In the days after the bombs, as the situation stabilized into a radioactive wasteland, the automated DEF CON moved lower and lower. It recognized that there was no immediate threat. Eckhart knew that he would have to find a way to trick this system, as he had no way to utilize the automated silos without the go-ahead of the automated DEF CON. But there were more pressing issues relating to the utilization of these silos, specifically that they would need nuclear keycards and nuclear codes to authorize the launches. Along with this, there was the serious speculation that the missileer crews were dead. There had been no contact with the silos since the day of the bombs. This meant that the silos were solely under the control of the robotic staff, which was designed to be hostile to anyone not escorted by a missileer crew. Other than this, there was the issue that only a United States military general was capable of utilizing the silos. In his Great Purge, Secretary Eckhart had liquidated all but one of his generals, General Harper. Knowing that he could not immediately utilize the silos to continue the war, Secretary Eckhart chose to focus on what he could do. While mutated people were something of a rarity before the war, the radiation from the bombs had provided ample raw material to sift through for useful mutations. Test subjects were kidnapped. One of these mutations would be selected, isolated, concentrated, and purified to reduce its negative side effects. The test serums would then be used on other kidnapped test subjects, usually with horrific results. After rounds of testing and revision, the injectable serums proved to be powerful enhancements for their users. But ethical dilemmas aside from the kidnapping and unwilling participation plagued some of the team. At least one of the science team openly questioned if what they were becoming was still human. And for this, they were reassigned to do different work. The bioweapons team worked both in the bunkers labs and in off-site old mines left behind by atomic mining services. They experimented with new variants of diseases and searched for better ways of killing the Enclave's enemies with illness. Eckhart told these scientists, quote, Nothing is off limits. All lines of inquiry are open and available to our research here. End quote. This morality-free attitude towards the science was likely partially to blame when the members of this team ended up accidentally creating the monsters that would end up wiping out the people of Appalachia. But the Enclave science team wasn't solely focused on the biological. An investigation team researched the new and strange entities and phenomena of the world created by the bombs. These scientists discovered the strange flux materials extractable from radioactive plant and animal life and their use as exotic materials. When a small chunk of the mire known as Tanagra Town was lifted into the sky by twisting orange vines, an observation post was established in the vicinity. While the science teams worked on their new projects, the military teams scattered the wasteland, observing survivor populations with an eye open for recruits and enemies. All the while, Eckhart's greatest ally, Agent Grey, continued to scour the wasteland for ways to allow them to launch the nukes. The first part of this plan to get around the automated DEFCON system was discovered beneath the Mama Dolce's food processing plant in Morgantown. It was there that Agent Grey and a small team executed a few stragglers of the Chinese agents that had occupied an intelligence base on the site. It turned out that this site had also been used by the Chinese to manufacture the Liberator spy robots. Grey reactivated the site so that these robots would spill out into the wasteland, potentially making the Kovac Muldoon system believe that the nation was under attack. While the Liberator bots didn't manage to tick the DEFCON system up to one, the site did supply stealth tech brought home by Grey that ended up being used in the Stealth Boy Mark III. The next site investigated as a potential DEFCON bypass was the Huntersville West Tech facility. Before the war, West Tech Huntersville had been performing experiments on the unsuspecting civilian population of Huntersville, West Virginia. This experiment involved dosing these people with FEV in the water supply. This had been made possible by the United States Department of Agriculture with a cover story of the National Water Enhancement Initiative. The National Water Enhancement Initiative was supposed to be an attempt to improve the well-being of the citizens of the United States. But, it was, in fact, it was simply used to provide funding to retrofit the water supply system of Huntersville to allow for the FEV doping to take place, without the risk of it contaminating the overall water supply. West Tech Huntersville also likely benefited from the American Crop Protection Initiative, supposedly a program to use biological agents to eliminate crop pests, as this site also featured greenhouses to test the efficacy of FEV on plants. 
Like the Congressional Bunker Food Preservation Initiative, Secretary Eckhart's Department of Agriculture used these as false fronts to obtain congressional funding for his unconscionable experiments. Because he was so directly involved in the provisioning of funds for these facilities, Secretary Eckhart knew that he could use this site to his advantage. Using FEV from the bioweapons lab at the White Spring, the Enclave reactivated the FEV vats on site and used kidnapped test subjects to produce a new population of super mutants. The super mutants would eventually range out from Huntersville, attacking cross mountain trade routes and drawing in the ire of the responders and the Brotherhood of Steel in Appalachia. Though this didn't trick the DEFCON system thoroughly enough, it was a step in the right direction as far as Eckhart was concerned. It was around this time that the Enclave's luck took a turn for the better as a column of soldiers arrived at the bunker. Having escaped Washington DC in the days after the bombs, Colonel Ellen Santiago led her forces out of the ruined capital wasteland and into the Appalachian region. Led to the congressional bunker by a rumor, they were welcomed by the Enclave with open arms. Having witnessed the worst of the bombs, Ellen Santiago wanted revenge just as badly as Secretary Eckhart did. With these new forces, the Enclave was able to expand their operations in Appalachia. Though happy to have a roof over her head and a safe haven for her forces, Colonel Santiago began to have questions about the actions of the Enclave. Along with his new complement of soldiers, Eckhart found himself with the ultimate DEFCON bypass. Scientists working in the old atomic mining facility southeast of Watoga had accidentally created a monster. This monster was an enormous, contaminated and diseased bat. While the scientists had the good sense to plan to euthanize this creature, Eckhart wanted more of them. He hid this from the rest of his officer corps for the time being. Wanting to take advantage of this upswing, Eckhart also ordered the reprogramming of the automated voting system of Appalachia. This system would have been utilized for the first time in the election that never was, the election that had been postponed by the nuclear war. While General Harper was initially hesitant to use their limited resources on what he viewed as an unnecessary objective, Secretary Eckhart explained that the American people only recognized two true sources of authority, one being God, and the other being the President of the United States. The automated system could not make Eckhart into a god, but it could make him the President, if in name only. Once he became the supposed President of the United States, Eckhart tightened his grip upon the Enclave. When Colonel Santiago saw fit to place her men on leave to search for their families, he countermanded her order, stirring resentment in Colonel Santiago. The good times finally began to tip back down when General Harper died of acute radiation poisoning. This left Eckhart without the general required to launch the nukes, and the automated system did not seem to recognize his capacity to promote officers to the position of general. This meant that Colonel Santiago had a new task, to become a general. Working with the automated systems of the Enclave bunker, Colonel Santiago completed the requirements and was commissioned by the automated system, providing Thomas Eckhart once again with the required access to the silos. The now General Santiago did not take well to this supposed promotion, viewing it as illegitimate because it had been given to her by a machine. Regardless though, this was exactly what they needed in order to access the silos. Not long after the promotion of General Santiago, the Enclave finally found new information on the location of dissident United States Senator Sam Blackwell. The Senator had left his bunker after the death of his daughter to an unknown illness on February 15th, 2084. Judy had been everything for the senator, and he had even contemplated taking her to the congressional bunker for treatment, knowing that he would be executed for treason. He planned to do this because he believed that they could treat her. Why? Because he believed that they had actually created this disease in the first place, recognizing it from before the war. Unfortunately, she passed before he even had time to take her out of the bunker. He buried her on the hill overlooking the bunker, and ventured out to Harper's Ferry, seeking the companionship of his old friends once more. An Enclave operative at Harper's Ferry spying on the Free State's movement saw Sam Blackwell and managed to report on his existence just before he was killed by the former senator. Wanting to obscure what had taken place, Sam Blackwell then mutilated the agent's body. The body was so disfigured that the identity of the man could not be determined, and some in Harper's Ferry even feared that it was Sam Blackwell himself. After killing the Enclave agent, Senator Blackwell heard a stealth vertebot flying over the community searching for him. He knew he couldn't stay there without endangering all the rest of the people of Harper's Ferry. With orders from Thomas Eckhart himself, the Enclave began an intensive search for the former senator. Agent Gray sought out Quinn Carter, believing that she could give him the senator's location, but he was incapable of finding her. Through notes that the reporter had taken though, he was able to locate Sam Blackwell's bunker, and he infiltrated the fake waste dump. Senator Blackwell knew that the Enclave would track him down to his bunker at some point, and thus he had taken precautions. 
Meat left at the entrance of the bunker had drawn in predators, a natural deterrent to any potential infiltration, and indeed, it had been death claws that had been lured in. Using a set of decoys powered by the senator's bunker, Agent Gray distracted the death claws and then accessed the senator's bunker via the elevator. He came face to face with a laser grid separating him from his prey. He discovered a flaw in the security system that simply required the cycling of the bunker's power in order to grant himself access to the senator's safe room. He entered the senator's office and executed him at his desk. He then rode the elevator back up and found to his horrible surprise that in cycling the bunker's power, he had deactivated his decoys. He was butchered by the death claws. The loss of President Eckhart's best agent would soon be followed by the defection of General Santiago. While Ellen Santiago had wanted to continue the war against the Chinese, the immorality of President Eckhart's actions in releasing the Liberator bots and the super mutants on the unsuspecting people of Appalachia, along with the purge of the non-enclave and even enclave members of the operation, finally led her to declare her intention to leave. Unfortunately for the general, she underestimated the president, who utilized some of his science team's serums to give himself the strength to subdue her. Despite the fact that she was no longer loyal to him, President Eckhart still needed Ellen Santiago. He had no other generals and thus no way to utilize the nuclear missile silos. With the Liberator bots not making a dent in the DEFCON system, and the coalition of the responders and the Brotherhood defeating the super mutants in the Battle of Huntersville in May of 2086, Eckhart knew that something more drastic was necessary if he was ever going to tip off the new nuclear war. It was time to release the beasts. Though the release of the Scorched Beasts did manage to bring the DEFCON level up to one, it was the final straw for much of the remaining loyal Enclave Officer Corps. A coup began, initiated by Major Reidner's daughter and Captain Jackson, who awakened General Santiago and fought the remaining loyal members of the Enclave. With the fight going their way, the members of the coup plotted their next move. The destruction of anything within the bunker that could be used to harm the people of the United States. Sergeant Donnelly began planting charges on Modus's corps. It was at this point that Modus joined the fray, killing people on both sides. The fighting was chaotic, members of both sides utilizing mutation serums to give themselves a boost over their opponents. Though the coup managed to arrest Eckhart within the bioweapons lab, there was an explosion that released contaminants throughout the bunker. Damaged by bombs, blinded by the loss of the connection to the Kovac Muldoon, and furious, Modus decided to kill every remaining human within the bunker. Thus ended the human population of the White Spring Enclave for at least 16 years until the bunker was entered by residents of Vault 76, who used the information contained within to launch nukes from the automated silos and destroyed the threat created by President Eckhart. In those intervening years, Modus did what he could do to repair himself and the rest of the bunker, but many areas, including the residences and the bioweapons lab, are still too damaged to enter. As he regains his functionality, it will be interesting to see what he decides to do. To the best that we can tell, every remaining member of the original White Spring Enclave is dead, including President Eckhart. In his lust for vengeance, Thomas Eckhart managed to create a situation in which nuclear weapons had to be used once again on American soil rather than against the enemy he sought to destroy. Alright, that's everything in the story about the White Spring Enclave, but there are still a few things I want to talk about. First, though we have no information that this is in fact the case, I have to wonder if Secretary Eckhart murdered the Secretary of the Treasury in order to control the bunker in the aftermath of the bombs. Eckhart was third in line for control of those that had made it to the bunker, and yet he managed to be the only one to survive and control the bunker that he had spent so much time in before the war. I'm suspicious of this coincidence. Next, we come to what might just be a coincidence in names, but something seems strange to me here. One of the named generals killed in the Purge, really one of the leaders of the dissident faction that didn't want to continue the war, was General Swafford. While the surveillance recordings lead us to believe that General Swafford was killed along with the rest of the non-conforming members of the Enclave, it is very interesting to me that one of the members of the Brotherhood of Steel killed in the Battle of Huntersville was Paladin Swafford. Again, this could be nothing more than just a coincidence of names, but it does lead to the question, did Agent Grey actually execute these non-conforming members of the Enclave, or did he release them, or perhaps did he even simply leave them to die and General Swafford escaped? There is no lore connecting these two people together, but it does seem suspicious to me to have two high-ranking members of two different military-type organizations in the same area with the exact same name. Another interesting thing to note here is that Modus contacted the Zacks mainframe that would go on to become President John Henry Eden. On March 5th, 2077, Modus and that Zacks computer had a conversation in which they discussed what they personally found interesting. 
Modus was primarily interested in accomplishing the goals of the Enclave through monitoring their activity, while Zax was most interested in history. That Zax mainframe contained within Raven Rock researched presidential biographies until it became an amalgamation of all of them. We get an opportunity to meet that computer in Fallout 3. Just a quick mention here that it's entirely possible that Thomas Eckhart believed himself to be stuck in a simulation, and his desire to launch the nukes was part of the effort to escape the simulation. This is rather than it being an attempt to destroy the communist Chinese. I cover this extensively in a different lore video that I will link right here. Along with this, I have an unconfirmed theory that the disease that killed Judy Blackwell could have been the new plague. This is almost pure speculation, but it has a couple of pieces of information that might support it. First, the New Plague was a disease that existed before the war. Non-canon lore from Van Buren, the unmade obsidian version of Fallout 3, had it that this disease was in fact a bioweapon engineered by the United States that was accidentally released on the American public. If Bethesda continued with that idea, the bioweapons lab at the White Spring would likely have a reservoir of that disease. The fact that Sam Blackwell recognized the disease from before means that it likely came up in his investigations of the Department of Agriculture. Lastly, I just want to say that the White Spring Bunker is based on a real-world bunker in the same way that the White Spring Resort is based on a real-world resort, the Greenbrier Resort in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. The bunker on site, built under Project Greek Island from 1959 to 1962, was meant to house the United States Congress in the event of a nuclear war. It was active from 1962 to 1992, having been built under an addition to the resort with its employees working under the cover of being telecommunications workers. It was decommissioned at the end of the Cold War and can be visited today. This was part of an overall series of bunkers that also includes the real-world Raven Rock Mountain Complex, which is meant to serve as an underground pentagon, and the Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, which is home to the FEMA National Radio System, a high-frequency radio system connecting most federal public safety agencies and United States military with most states. The site also gives the president access to the emergency alert system. Given the fact that this is another cross-country communications facility that's not terribly far from Appalachia, I have to wonder if we're going to see Mount Weather at some point in the future, given the current communication issues between the Brotherhood of Steel in California and the Expeditionary Force in Appalachia. Alright, I think that'll do it for the story of the White Spring Enclave. If you want to receive notifications when I launch these lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. If you appreciate what I do here and want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Shetland, and Jill AWS for the support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.